taken us a bit of time to get to this point, as in, you know, about a year since we met maybe and uh, arrange and kind of like get together. So thank you for having us at your home firstly as well. That's really kind of you. Um, I just wanted to get started about how your entry came into fashion. What point, what moment did you kind of think this is for me? I love this or that's where I'm going. Uh, I think um, it's kind of process of elimination being a, a creative, a sort mm. of I would sort of say a sort of blanket creative because I can do various different mm. things. So it was kind of more like, well, what do I do with this? I can't do anything else. You know, I, I couldn't, I, I, my brain doesn't work mm -hmm. in that way. So I had to find a, a way to be me and try and make a career out of it. So I went to, um, you know, I went through school sort of doing the arts and then I decided to go to art school mm -hmm. to do a foundation to try to, you know, then again, mm -hmm. through a, a, a foundation, you can sort of try different things. And so my, and then my thing, I wanted to do fine art and they were like, you're definitely not good enough. So I was gutted, but um, that pushed me into textiles. Yeah. Which, I, which you know, it's like fine art on fabric. Yeah. Um, and then I went to, I mean, I'm, I knew I was never a designer. Mm -hmm. I can't design per se. Mm -hmm. But I could always, I was always dressing up. I was it. always doing yeah. outfits. And I ended up going to London College of Fashion and we did a module on styling. And mm -hmm. I suddenly was like, oh, oh, bingo. This, this is what mm -hmm. I want to do. Um, which combined a visual language mm -hmm. and also the sort of a communication, a cultural communication. Mm -hmm. And also the fashion industry mm -hmm. having a verbal communication yeah. as well. And a way to shape things and change and yeah. So. So you've had like quite a varied career in the sense that you've done Britain's Next Top Model, you've mm. done X Fact, you've you know shot world renowned magazines. Mm. Um, how how has what you've done shaped what you're doing now, and how how have you taken that forward or looked at that retrospectively and and kind of moved into what you're doing now and and, and the emotion behind what you were doing at that time, I guess. I mean, I guess I've been working in the fashion industry so long that it, the industry itself has changed yeah. quite a lot. You know, when I first got my first job at Ajahn Fogter, I just graduated from London College of Fashion. I think I was 19. There was no such thing as email. Mm -hmm. We still faxed everybody. Uh, so the, the nature of the business was yeah. totally different. Um, I, I feel like with the education system, you, you know, when you're young and you're in school, Everyone's just trying to find a, a vocation mm -hmm. for you. What are you good at? What can you go into mm. to do to make money? Obviously, this is the sort of hamster wheel that we're on. And it's kind of quite intense when you're young. Mm. There isn't a kind of thing where you're like, oh, you know, I don't sort of, I don't really know what I want to do or who mm. I am yet. But And you've got to you pick quite anything. early on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've absolutely. got to choose, yeah. So I chose fashion because it felt, it felt like a place that mm. I could exist alongside other creatives it felt like a sort of band of sort of um, creative like come there was camaraderie but that the, the fashion industry sort of is extremely good at its its own kind of PR mm -hmm. and smoke and mirror so what you see from the outside isn't really what happens on the inside yeah. but it takes you a long time you know it took me 10 years of just being determined to succeed I was like and you know and blinkers on you were just like and must succeed success 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 what, success what was success at that point to you I guess you know um I guess, you know, I I was quite shy at college, you know, to, to pursue those dreams. And everyone's a bit like, you know, I'm, there's never that person because I never really knew what to do that was like, I'm going to be a lawyer and then you go and study and be a lawyer. But, you know, being a creative, it's a bit like, ah. Yeah. Um, so the styling thing was, it was very early on in the styling days mm -hmm. when, you know, there was, there was fashion editors who would obviously mm -hmm. still at that time were very much controlling mm -hmm. the messaging that was yeah. going out. It was very much like a, you will wear this, this is out, mm -hmm. this is in kind of thing. And then there were these kind of like rebel creators, people like Judy Blaine coming through that were just changing things up on a sort of, on a, the magazines that I was reading, like The Face and ID, mm -hmm. you could kind of really see this sort of creative explosion yeah. coming. And I was like, that's what I want to get involved in. But I was still very shy. Mm. And to really sort of go out and grab that by the balls, I was like, oh. you kind of had to be, you kind of had to have a foot in in the industry mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. or be quite an extraordinary young person. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I was. But so I, um, I looked for a company 
that I felt like represented me, a mm-hmm. brand that represented me. And I wanted to work for Westwood, but I was too shy. To and go like, and knock yeah, on the door. Yeah, to yeah. be like, hi, hi, I want to work with <laughs> you. Because it literally is like, hi, hi, I'm great. Uh, and I just wasn't that person. And then I stumbled a- across Ashram Provocateur and then found out the backstory that Joe was Vivian's yeah. son. And it was just one moment in Soho one night and it was a Berwick Street shop and I saw this like neon stuff and I was like, oh my God, this is like the The inside of my head. Mm. And so I wrote to them, I wrote them a letter and just was really passionate about it. And they started me on like literally no money and just doing bits and bobs. And I so worked in the shop and I worked in the office because I had varying skills. And I'd worked at the Groucho Club Mm. as I was paying my way through college and that was like a big thing, like connections. And um, and I just sort of grew my way up through that company, mm-hmm. sort of proving, you know, their PR, the girl that was doing the PR left, and I immediately was like, yeah. I want to do that. And so that kind of grew mm-hmm. that way. Until I'd been there for about four years, and I felt like I'd learned what I needed to mm-hmm. learn there for that particular part of the fashion mm. industry. And I was kind of yearning to do stuff kind of off my own back mm-hmm. kind of thing. And so I left to become a stylist. I kind of knew a few people yeah. at that point, And I just sort of did the leap. And I think London at the time, I mean, that must have been like 2001, maybe two. London at the time, you could kind of do that. You know, yeah, you could move just, around. Yeah. Kind of be, yeah. yeah. And also be able to afford to live and kind of like, you know, sort of, scrape by basically. Basically, yeah. you know, <laughs> live like a sort of creative and but live in the center of town. Mm. Um, and then, so I was a freelance for like, you know, t- in, in the end for like 20 years doing different things. But I was always, I always felt like I was more of a creative consultant. I love branding side of things. I'm a writer as well. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just pure styling that I did. And then as the digital age grew mm-hmm. for fashion, I saw a window of going, fashion is so visual. This is going to go bonkers. And so that's why I decided to get into kind of presenting. Yeah. So the first thing I did was for on off and we did a kind of, you know, hosting and curating thing. And then, you know, and as you've seen now, mm. you know, it's, it's, you can't have it without that. Now. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and then I literally <clears throat> landed top model, um, like, like the biggest kind of TV job within mm. the, within the entertainment industry. Yeah. And I didn't really know what I got into and it was amazing and completely overwhelming at the same time. So I trod that path for a while. And I did until I did X Factor, and what I felt is going more into the entertainment side of things. They take less seriously the creative and yeah. fashion side of things, and that's why fashion is kind of very special. I mean yeah. that in both ways, in the fact that you have room to create mm. the the um, creative process is respected. There is, um, you know, there you are. You have the time to research things. And as I did X Factor, that got cut. Mm. And it was very much, I was pushed into doing high street, high street, high yeah. street, high street, high street. And I, you know, yes, I was the first person to get, you know, brilliant vintage and, you know, mm. uh, any, any kind of like stuff that wasn't just pushing yeah. capitalism, consumerism. I did it. But on the flip side, I couldn't, I couldn't not do it without yeah. having piles of stuff mm-hmm. and it just and I just was I felt like I was sinking under it I always think about you know labyrinth that the bag yeah. lady but yeah, that's yeah. what I felt like I was just sinking under this mountain of stuff yeah, mountain yeah. of yeah. clothes and stuff and and I just I, I felt like I was losing my grip on why I started working mm-hmm. in fashion mm-hmm. which was a kind of um, self-expression clothes for me were like an alternative Mm, cultural yeah Yeah, and an alternative personality Mm -hmm. when I was young I I realized that you could manipulate people with what you wear Mm -hmm. quite easily literally people take you at service value so if you want to dress up like you know top to toe Chanel people think you're rich yeah you know it's as simple as that and it's just it's a real it's such an interesting game to play but I felt I was really losing touch with the kind of um what I would had got into a creative industry mm-hmm. for and so um I my mental health really started to mm. struggle because I didn't feel like I was like I felt like it was all running away from yeah. me and I didn't quite know what to do and I couldn't grab it back I couldn't suddenly be like I didn't do that because once you do 
Amazing. commercial things like X Factor. You know, I was working a lot for the Sunday Times style mm-hmm. doing covers. They're a bit like it's there is a there's a chasm yeah. between commerciality yeah. and creativity, and all of a sudden it's like oh that's that's a bit commercial, mm. and so almost like it's seen a bit of a dirty thing. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. It's um, you know, commerciality and 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 high fashion have never had a great relationship yeah. um, because I feel like you know there is a very maybe a bit of an ivory tower yeah. that sort of high fashion lives on. Perhaps because it has to justify mm. that by the price point, or it's it needs its rare ability. Yeah. Um, and so you know there are there's a divide, isn't there? Yeah, there's sure, a huge yeah. end yeah, of yeah. the spectrum. Um, you know, luxury is something that mm. we that we I think should talk about this notion of what luxury yeah. is now. So uh, you know, when I was the, going to catwalk shows a lot, you know, there would be meters and meters of this kind of luxury carpet that mm-hmm. would just be ripped up the minute the 15 yeah, minute show's done. over ripped up put in it put in a, a dumpster <clears throat> and people don't think about that because they're yeah. they're trying to create this magic of this environment with in which these luxury yeah. clothes should be shown and i started seeing that and i was like this is kind of gross this yeah. is really wasteful and then that started getting worse like you've got mm-hmm. set building at chanel that are building like rockets and the worst one is like building forests and you're yeah. like this is gone Nuts. bonkers yeah. this is truly the emperor's new clothes because it's like whilst on one hand like the you know we've got this environmental crisis yeah. and then like carl Lagerfeld's making clothes to go in a forest but the entire set's going to be ripped down and put in a yeah. you know burn or put in a tip you know just like what are oh, we doing? What yeah. is going on? And that's when I started to just go, true luxury is something that we, it, it's, it's something that is actually time. Mm. Time to think about something. Time to wait mm-hmm. for something. Time to commission something. Time for something to make, to make yeah. something. That you can, that you sit and you wait for something and then finally when you get it delivered, mm. you're like, oh, you I've been waiting for this mm. for so long. And that is the nature of true luxury now. Mm-hmm. The, the, the fact that we leave no footprint, yeah. the fact that we do no damage, mm. that is where true luxury yeah. is, is happening. This bullshit that we, you know, people traipse around in, in high heels on thick on thick carpets and drink champagne, you know, it's... Yeah, it's, it's not reality. It's, yeah, it's completely disconnected to who we are and the world and what we're doing. So how can we use, you know, as a stylist or a voice within the industry, mm. you know, how can we make sure that we don't do that and, and shift it towards something better, to, towards this time element, this emotional connection, not discarding kind of, you know, really loving again? I think um, thinking about the destabilization of consumerism, mm-hmm. so what, you know, to, to make you overbuy Mm-hmm. What marketing does is destabilize you out of your individuality. Mm-hmm. So it makes you go, I'm not good enough. And if I buy this stuff that everybody else is buying, I will fit in the pack. Mm-hmm. So there's, you know, there were, there, of course, there are some people that are leaders and some people that are followers. But for the most part now, we're all being homogenized into looking in, looking the same way. And even facially and everything. Like, you know, yeah. we're all becoming <laughs> our own, you know, kind of robotic mm-hmm. means you yeah. know we yeah. are we're becoming our um and what are they called uh i can't think of the word uh like our online yeah. personalities and avatars I avatars think. we are becoming <laughs> or we're trying yeah. you know it's like yeah, we're yeah. becoming our avatars yeah. both with surgically and and but also sort of morphing into this kind of like especially with instagram this very specific type mm. of dressing that it, and it's uh, I think individuality is being eroded yeah. and so I think the resilience and the antidote is it, it to it is is if the flip side of the homogenization is individuality on Instagram so if everybody's like looking for this there's so there's so much of this sort of alternative personalities mm-hmm. like but they've almost like another kind of fetishization in Mm -hmm. a way but it is having things that not everybody else has Mm -hmm. things that they can't have things that you found that you've altered that you've made for yourself um and i don't mean saying at home crafting but what i mean is you know finding an amazing piece and 
you know, and having it tailored to your shape. Mm. You know, not just going, oh, it doesn't fit me. So ordering something from yeah. Etsy or eBay and, oh, it doesn't fit. You know, it's like, well, make it into something else if it doesn't and work. And having the skills or, to do that. And... Or just, you know, or taking it to a tailor, work mm. with somebody. Mm-hmm. It doesn't cost that much money. Mm. Um, I think individuality is, is is such a rebellion in these days that it, it's finding that. And, um, and so I think some people are like, well, I don't know who I am. Mm. And it's until you sort of strip it all back Mm -hmm. that you can kind of be like, oh, actually, well, what if you're not buying all the time? It gives you that kind of thing to be like, actually, don't buy a trend. Mm. Who are you underneath it? Because I think that especially young women are being forced into being sexualized the whole time. Yeah. The sort of Kim Kardashian type that I, you know, that I don't think they really understand perhaps sort of like the long-term damage that mm. that does to themselves and others and yeah and yeah. and sort of um and the women around them and 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 other women which is why i started body of work yeah. so body of work projects i had taken i guess a leaf out of their book out of the book of the sort of instagram generation and also the kind of love island generation when it's not if you can't beat them join them it's kind of like I'm going to use the visual language mm-hmm. that people now understand as to, my to tools talk with, to yeah. try and, yeah. to try to usurp or to sort of mm. like you know to sort of like hoodwink a different message yeah. into it. So I, as I mentioned before, I started in fashion in the '90s, but I was so pressured. I feel to succeed, mm. I didn't get time to kind of be like actually. Who am I within this industry? Yeah. Because you get sort of swept up yeah. by the industry because it's so fast moving yeah. and You're changed on a roller so much. Coaster, yeah. 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 So I didn't get time to be like, how do I feel about this? And actually, internally, mm. for a long time, I was a real mess mm-hmm. and really broken. And then, you know, I got very mentally unwell and physically, you know, I was always, always dieting. Physically, I was always trying to be thinner mm. than I am naturally and got really messed up about it. Mm-hmm. And so if you fast forward sort of sort of 20, maybe more years later, after I had my son, my mum died when he was eight weeks old. She had a lifelong eating disorder. Mm-hmm. And suddenly I was like, my, my life, it basically imploded. Yeah. And I felt like it happened for a reason. Yeah. To because rebuild. I had, so, yeah, I had nothing, yeah. nothing. The structures of my life, who I was before, mm-hmm. I couldn't even build anything out mm-hmm. of the ashes of that. And there was nothing left. And mm. I was like, this is, if you get you, you get these moments in life for a reason. And I yeah. was like, and also I was just unhappy before, even though on the outside people have been like, oh my God, she's famous, yeah. successful. Living the life yeah. and going around. Yeah. And world. like, you know, taking yeah. photos of my new Louboutins all the time. It, I was empty. I was empty yeah. and actually sort of dreadfully unhappy. Mm. So I just took this moment to rethink. It took me a, a, a while mm. to just sort of go, to just try and clear my mind of all the stuff that we think that we should mm-hmm. be. And just to sit and be quiet for <laughs> a while. It's not an easy thing though, is it? No. When it's bombarded from day one, really, yeah. and especially as women, and when you have your references as your mom or whoever, you uh-huh. know, it's kind of, that's a difficult thing to do, right? Because it's so ingrained. But this is where, you know, and I find the mindfulness, you know, you can take it or leave it. But when you've got to really, when you've just got to make some real like life affirming decisions, having Mm -hmm. that sort of mindfulness mindset, just to kind of be able to go stop the noise. Mm. And the noise for me is like thousands of images every day. So I stop buying magazines. Mm -hmm. I stop consuming media. I stop watching the news. You know, even I stop, you know, I used to love reading the Sunday papers. But I stopped wanting other people's opinions in my head so I could at least try and hear myself yeah. mm-hmm. and feel what myself needed. Yeah. Um, and that's hard when you're a commuter or you've got, you know, you've got a job mm-hmm. and you've got opinions, opinions, opinions. But it's And even... actually you're asked for your opinion on a lot of things yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, so you've yeah, got yeah, to be yeah. in context relative to what you're talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I, ha- I had to take some time out for my mental health. I yeah. had to. You know, I would I would class it as I had a nervous breakdown, mm-hmm. but I feel like more it was like actually 
it was like, yes, it was that, but my, my life just needed readjusting. Yeah. And I think it's a rare, and I would not wish that on anybody. Mm. I would say to people, if you have any questions inside about how you're living your mm. life, the impact you're having in the environment, is try and give yourself that headspace. Mm. And actually some of the easiest ways of doing that is going running. Mm. Go, you know, go, go, go outside, yeah. go and run for half an hour. It doesn't have to be a marathon, mm. but that is incredible. Yeah. Just being amongst nature mm -hmm. and just going and just breathing breathing and running there's amazing how you can shut out yeah. the noise of all of the other stuff and suddenly your own true voice yeah. starts coming through and you're like wow hi where have you been yeah and because, the stillness within that and yeah kind of yeah you can talk and to that's yourself. when answers yeah. start coming yeah and until you can create that space mm -hmm. for yourself the answers don't come but also because consumerism doesn't want yeah. you to be able no. to do that because a destabilized person buys more stuff yeah yeah, and you know, ultimately, these companies are pushing you to buy. So, how did you turn? You know, you've now kind of got no ashes to build from. Mm -hmm. How have you then built back up and listened to this stillness, listened to the the voice within your true self, and kind of built upon that now to this point? I mean, obviously, obviously, for all of us, there's the you know, the big question is how do I marry my pressure to earn mm -hmm. and sustain like not a you know I have quite a simple lifestyle now but you know it's not like I've moved to an ashram mm -hmm. and, you know and decided that that's that's yeah. it you know I yeah. have nothing and there's I'm actually actually most of the time I, mm. I could really happily get rid of everything mm. that I own and, and you're I, still very part of fashion, though. This is a thing. It's kind of this yeah. draw, you know. Yes. Yeah. In and I out. mean, I think that it's part. It's so indelibly ingrained because it's in me. Because it, it's a fashion is a coping mechanism for me for the way I was brought mm -hmm. up. So then that's incredibly toxic. But I feel like that is becoming a whole other layer. For younger people mm -hmm. because their identities are bound up with their photographs and yeah. their photographs are bound up with what clothes they're wearing mm -hmm. and they feel like they can't repeat outfits mm. and stuff like that and the pressure is unending um but i started a shop it was a dream i started a vintage and ethical shop just around the corner from here obviously i had a small child i thought it was manageable mm -hmm. but again retail is retail yeah and there was and the, the pressure on making that work, you know, it's um, it's a very different model. Mm. And I did it for a few years, and then, but I was uh, I was headhunted to um, relaunch Zandra Rose mm -hmm. and use her archive. Yeah. You know, her her label is as near as ethical yeah. as I could get it to. So I was happy working for mm -hmm. her because obviously, once you step off the mm -hmm. the bandwagon. It's hard to then find yeah. pockets of brands that are doing it. Yeah. So Zandra Prince makes those everything in her own building in London, you know. And so that you know, with no mm. kind of hardly any footprint, mm. you know, to me, I was like, I can, yeah. I can do this. I can yeah. live with this. And rolling on from that, I felt like I needed to do more than just one label. Mm -hmm. And actually, I felt like I was having a sort of again a personal crisis that I felt like no matter what you do with fashion you kind of go down one path mm. it's kind of always the same and perhaps the one thing I had never resolved in my life was the body image thing because I felt like wherever you went with fashion it always came down to what models were you booking and how famous were they and can they fit in the clothes and what do the clothes look like so and, yeah. I again mentally felt like I needed to take a t time out and that's when I started body of work and mm -hmm. I started it mostly because my mum had died you know mm -hmm. whole you know almost wholly because of her eating disorder issues which then gave her mental health issues yeah. and I was like I can't be on this planet just to sell stuff yeah and I needed to have that moment of feeling like I was apologizing mm -hmm. for going back to the, the work that I did at the beginning where I didn't think about mm -hmm. how this was affecting other women because you don't, because you're so... Head down, looking yeah, for success. Yeah, trying, trying to succeed. Yeah. And so you don't... When you're from a, coming from a, a, a junior place, you don't get to, like, call the shots. No, you don't get to go, actually, no. uh, actually, really famous male photographer, i really uncomfortable yeah. with her boobs out and yeah. stuff like that. Now, I obviously would. And I think what I think is great mm. is 
the power that Instagram has given women. Yeah. Because they are finally, the voices has been taken away mm-hmm. from the male photographers, they've been taken away from the editors to be like, you know, it's a democratic space. Mm-hmm. No matter what's, no matter the downside of it, mm. there's a democracy to how women want to see themselves mm-hmm. displayed. And there is a, there's a whole conversation about like inhaled misogyny, regurgitated misogyny. Mm. And also what I'm, what I and other people are doing and going, Okay, you know what? If I'm not going to be represented anywhere else, I'm going to do. I'll myself. represent myself. Yeah. yeah, you know, and then you start an open dialogue with women that has been shut down mm-hmm. because of the destabilization process. Mm-hmm. So if you're not part of a community, you know, if you're safe and happy in a community, you don't need all that stuff. Yeah, you're like actually, your friends are backing you up. You don't care if you're pin thin because you like you're happy. You yeah. Know, what do you mean? Because you're talking to the people around yeah. you, and that's all that matters. Yeah. To you. How have you found actually the reaction to your body of work project? Then. Oh, um, like properly amazing. Um, I didn't. I didn't know what it would be. I just. You know, I felt an urgency mm-hmm. to do it, and actually, the original idea came as a reaction to my role on Prince Exxon Model, in which wasn't an easy process mm. for me tv is a very um edited process mm-hmm. and i felt like i had been become a caricature of a of a fashion bitch yeah. and so as a reaction to that because obviously my mum in the background is dying of an eating disorder and i've got girls tweeting me going what size is normal and i'm like there is no there's no such thing as normal yeah. no such thing as a size normality it's about you being happy and healthy in mm. here and how you achieve that. Um, and if that's go running or if that's, you know, or it doesn't matter what mm. actual size you are, if you're happy and healthy. I wasn't happy and healthy at the time, but as a, I felt like as I needed to do a personal yeah. project because I felt like I'd had my voice taken away. So I wanted to get um, a group of... Um, Influential women, and this is only when Twitter was around, mm-hmm. it, Instagram hadn't started, so it was much more hard to do yeah. a, a, a visual, visual project. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to get influential women who had become successful not because of their body type. So they didn't have to like snap back body because they were in TV, or they didn't have to, you know, this sort of stuff. It was like they could be chefs or they could be scientists. And I wanted to do a nudes project, so, you know, to show their different mm-hmm. body shapes. Now, with hindsight, it, it it's still objectifying the female body mm-hmm. to get a message across. So it's like a double-edged sword in a way. But at the time, it it was, again, I was at two ahead of the time because it didn't, it, people didn't necessarily get it and I yeah. didn't know where to put it. Was it a press project? You know, there wasn't the outlet of just doing a visual project and mm. knowing that thousands and being an thousands artist, could basically. see it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I would have to, yeah, work with a gallery. I'd have to be a curator. And it just didn't fly until I felt this pressure. And I felt like I was waiting and waiting and waiting for a photographer to to turn up as the structure, but not even the structure of my career. The whole kind of gaslighting of being brought up in the 80s that a Disney, a Disney, you know, a Disney prince was going to turn up and save me or just like do the stuff. And I just got to the point where I was like, Nobody's going to yeah. turn up. I've got to do this myself. And I just grabbed an iPhone, my son, did a photo and went, this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling mm-hmm. mental. I'm feeling like I've been on holiday. I've been in a bikini for two weeks. I'm, incre- I'm incredibly lucky to be here. Why am I so unhappy? Why am I feeling so mm. crazy? And I've never had a response like it. Just not as in validation, mm. not as in likes, but the conversations mm. and people were DMing me. And it was just, and I was suddenly felt like I was speaking the same, the right language. Yeah. Because in fashion, I'd always felt like I was speaking a different language to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Not the, I wasn't speaking fashion language. And finally, I was like, this is my mm-hmm. tribe. Mm-hmm. These are the people that we're speaking our truths yeah. going, I'm this, I'm, I don't feel like I'm cut out for this. This is not working. This is making me unhappy. That, you know, no matter how thin or fit or rich or successful I am, I am still unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't live like this. And so I just decided that I needed to talk about it. And then as I needed to put some structure into it, I decided that there needed to be like an MO, like a Mm -hmm. modus operandi. So the rules became, 
no fashion tricks, obviously because styling yeah. has always been my thing. So strip that away. No retouch, mm -hmm. because I think that actually we, we know, and I've been involved in retouching women. You know, and you're just brutal. Oh yeah, yeah, shave that off, do this, that and the other. Oh, we'll do that in post. Yeah. And it becomes a language you don't think about. And you yeah. don't think about the effect on other people mm -hmm. until it happens to mm -hmm. you. So when I feel like fashion and TV had spat me out, or I'd sort of self-sabotaged because mm. I could no longer do it, I was suddenly on the other end yeah. of it, of being like, oh, these images are making me feel... But actually, they don't had all along. Mm. I was just desperately trying to make myself work or make myself so good that they didn't affect me. Yeah. But a lot of the time working with models, I'd come home like, oh, oh my God, ma. You know. Um, yeah. So... No clothes, no retouch, no diet and no workout schedule. Mm -hmm. And these are key because I feel like the now it's it's all like work out for your selfie, mm. your revenge look or your kind of like every celebrity mm. is doing their juice fasting or A they've diet, got their workout yeah. thing or they're just doing their videos the whole time. You know, mm -hmm. and at first I felt angry about those women in the, in the public mm -hmm. eye who were doing that relentlessly. Mm. And I was like, they're just caught up in the same... The yeah like evil machine and it's not their fault mm -hmm. what they need to so instead of pointing a finger being like oh this woman's doing that what i felt is i had to show everybody yeah. what i felt inside and so the and so doing a nude with the contacts that i have so the the rebellious part mm. of it like the provocative part is going back and only working with photographers mm -hmm. that i work with photographers mm -hmm. that have retouched photographers that have done yeah. all of that stuff and then putting myself in it and, and for them to then mm, think... See the difference. Oh, mm. right. This still looks like my work, but that's just a kind of like average body. Mm. You know, it's not an extreme body either way. You know, and that's why I don't call myself a BOPO or body positive kind of mm. campaigner or activist. Whilst I love would, would love to be, I'd love to think that that's what I'm mm. doing, but I don't want to be criticised for what size I yeah. am. You're it's, just you and you're a body and, yeah. and you're representing how you feel. Yeah. yeah, and just trying to show the tricks within high production mm. fashion photography because that's my remit yeah. of of what the difference between... Because, you know, many, many um, high-end celebrity photographers and retouchers, you know, this isn't a campaign of hate. They say that, that the talent, the celebrities, are too scared yeah. to show any imperfections mm. or any flesh and i think that unless there's a whole unless i'm doing this and other people are doing you know it's not going to happen demi lovato mm -hmm. the other day did you know she said i have been terrified of this moment yeah. this is me unedited in a bikini i mean that and the, yeah. the fact that that is a first fear, is like yeah. bonkers you know and i've been doing this for a year mm. and i'm seeing the trickle through yeah i'm starting to see people are like you know, and it's the fear, like getting over that barrier because you don't have a support mechanism. Yeah. So you create, you you know, you are creating this kind of place or this safe space where people can just become. Yeah. You know. And it's amazing. The minute you face up to your biggest fear, which mm. for a lot of people yeah. is being naked and photograph, then actually you just let stuff go. Mm. You're like, because we microanalyze our images. We microanalyze what we look like because that is the pressure mm. that is put on yeah. women. And so once you sort of give that up and you start to go, actually, I'm not that bad. Really, is this, is that bad? Yeah. You know, is that, is that terrible? And once that, that iron grip mm. is let go, it's incredible how life flows a bit more. Mm. And it's, it's, for me, I would like to try, take the project bigger. And bearing in mind, I'm, nobody's paying me to do yeah. this, is to, hold the hand so what i used to do as a stylist you know and also sort of guiding yeah. people through what to wear is guiding people through doing a nude shot and then being and then seeing them come out of the other side to being that really that mm -hmm. nerves i mean the first time i was working with a photographer and he was like so i had my gown <laughs> kind of here and he was like you know you've got to you just to take it off drop the gown <laughs> and i was like i thought i was gonna vomit yeah. on the floor right there and then and then I just dropped it. And then I was like, oh my God, this is so weird. And then it was just kind of work as usual. Yeah. He's like, look this way, look that way, do this, do that. Okay. And he's like, look at the monitor. And I'm not a model. 
But what I would love to do... You do know how to to hold yourself and like... You learn stuff over the years. But what I would love to, if I could impart anything now, and this is the point of which Mm -hmm. I want to give back, is that I would love to give people their shutteries, their own shutteries, Mm. but then I just go, okay... This is this is the angle that you're going to be yeah. shot from because obviously you, you they can't don't necessarily know, yeah. you know, unless you're mm-hmm. going to do a wall of mirrors. Yeah. And then I mean the cost of that is just like <laughs> beyond. But I would like to try to turn it into something else mm. because I think it's so needed. It's needed, yeah, definitely. Um, that kind of comes on quite nicely too. We had a, a question from a lady called Jade who started um, a company called Lonehood, which is basically a rental company for clothing, obviously. Great, sustainability. Um, sustainability, yes. yes. And she actually is a model herself. She's okay. from Middlesbrough, which is kind of near where I was brought up. So I was born in Newcastle, kind of moved near there. And she um, actually was on Britain's Next Top Model. Oh, so, not my one then. No, I think you were maybe a little bit later okay. as a judge, but... Um, she wants to know how can, what do you feel the direction of the future of modelling and ethicality and ethics around modelling is, and also how can models then use their position of power to, to make the world a better place or to support this kind of like body positivity or you know nudge how you are doing as well you know. So I think that's a brilliant question. I think if you look at the sort of modern modeling success Mm. stories i think the leadership is there so if you look at adwa if you look at charlie howard and her story is that she talked out against her agents for saying that she wasn't thin enough and by their standards she probably wasn't but she she has made a career out of not being standard standard you know um, Mm. model size she's got a book out she's got a makeup range and i think that you know yes modeling there is that thing that you have to become a brand and i think that that is a hell of a lot of pressure but i think in terms of ethics and pushing back i think about think about consistency look Mm -hmm. you can be ethical or not ethical that's your choice but at least be consistent with it so you know you can't do primark and you know greenpeace and you know and and you can't be a campaigner and then on the flip side go and do the kind of high street stuff I think Emma Breshi is somebody who, she's like an, you know, because mm-hmm. you can be an Instagram model yeah. now and not have to be just Well, Instagram's even on your cards now. Right, so sure, you... because you're following. And that's why you have <laughs> to be interesting. Amazing. It's like, you know, you have to be, you have to have an opinion. Yeah. Or you have to basically whore yourself out. You know, you have to wear as little clothes as possible. And I'm like to girls like, no, don't do mm. that. Please choose art over just become like a sort of Insta whore. Um, I think that, pushing back on your brands, Mm. asking if it is through your agent, not being afraid to go, what's that, what, what, what's their, what's their policies? Mm. You know, because if you are going to physically be represent Mm. this brand, you are almost a first port of call. So I know that they're going to, you're just going to turn up on the day and you don't really have to think Mm. about it, but you're going to be on all of the billboards. And actually now you can get, you can be absolutely taken to task on Instagram by people going, well, you know, why why are you doing that? You know, why, why would you back up that brand? And it can be a rabbit hole. Mm. So I think thinking about the sort of campaigns that you mm. take and also going to people yeah. and saying, I think that, you know, and, and not be, every time I've put energy out there because energy creates mm. energy. Every time I've written to somebody or like actually, you know, DM them and been terrified but the result has always been positive mm-hmm. because if people don't know that you're interested, they're never going to know. You don't exist to them. Yeah. So, you know, commenting on people's brands you like that is that are ethical, mm-hmm. saying, I'd love to model for you. I'd love to represent mm-hmm. you. Or reposting stuff, just generally sort of getting behind stuff, putting the energy. Yeah. One of my things that um, I wanted to talk about was my sort of um, raison d'etre, things that I've learned in life is... It's the same as driving, right? And the driving instructor would say, you're going to look, wait, you're going to go where you look. So, mm. you know, you're driving Head and you sort of look that, you just end up sort of like <laughs> vying off that way. Yeah. Life is exactly the same. Where you focus your energy mm. is what will happen, it will yeah. manifest. So if you're not putting the energy in there, in there and just being like, oh, I'll just do this because it comes, come, mm. it's come in. It's not going to go in that direction. Yeah. It's literally sort of having a, a roadmap yeah and you know yes you sort of go off the path but having a 
point to focus yeah. on, to move towards. It's been the biggest thing mm. that I've learned because you can feel a bit lost sometimes. You don't really know. And putting energy out there all the time is exhausting. Mm. But it's when it starts to come back to you, yeah. it starts when it starts... To recharge you again. That's isn't right. It? Yeah. And you go, yeah. oh, I'm, I am in control of this thing. Yeah. Because a lot of the time with agents and our careers, you don't necessarily feel mm -hmm. in control. But if you're putting the stuff out there and going, I want to do that, I want to do this, you, put, you are mm. putting yourself in control. And I think, you know, saying to your, having the conversation with your agent saying, you know, I want to do more ethical mm. work. And the more that models push back yeah. and saying no to the unethical mm. brands, no to the high street until they sort it out, until yeah. they can really show mm. them that, they, you know, that they can say, yeah. This has been made in a way that you would be yeah. proud of. Then you know that then they they're not going to change. Yeah. So and I, that I know that means maybe a financial sacrifice mm. on somebody's behalf. But hey, it has to happen mm. because the bottom line isn't always profit. Yeah. yeah. Got to come up with a different version yeah. of success and yeah. what is yeah successful. Um, just thinking about talking about the high street and and different shapes and sizes yeah. and, and um, the work that I do with Fashion Roundtable and our um, representation and inclusion survey. Could you just think a little bit about how you envisage the future of fashion in the sense of what would this inclusive world look like? What would a brand look like kind of? Um, I mean, is that is that something that you could think about? Or do you think it's just everything, everybody, you know, kind of because yeah, what what does it look like? What does this world that we're trying to aim towards really look like? I mean, I, I, I don't know, because some days I'm just like, it all just needs to stop. You know, if we go if we go to Extinction Rebellion sort of side of things, mm -hmm. I'm like, we don't need one more piece of clothing on the planet mm -hmm. because there is already enough in circulation that we could take a break, you know, but then we have, there are other reasons why... You know, it's economy is cyclical, so you know we wouldn't have. So if we weren't didn't have the fashion companies paying taxes, rents, this sort of stuff, we also wouldn't have the NHS and the other stuff that our taxes pay pays for. Mm -hmm. So we can't just all of a sudden grind to a halt. So we have to find a way of a more sustainable production. Mm -hmm. Um. So like we was we were talking about earlier. So Maslow's what is it hierarchy, the hierarchy of needs. Of needs has clothing yeah. in it so it's one of the things we need as humans so mm. we can't just go like like we could do away with tobacco yeah. and alcohol you know there could be prohibition yeah. but we still need to wear clothes mm. whether we would run out of clothes if we stopped yeah. making them now um i just think there are slightly different models mm. so for example the i still work on one small fashion brand because i still love fashion yeah. i love the way that you feel that's above and beyond when you put something mm. incredible or something that you love on, yeah. that the, you can feel protected, you can feel um, highlighted, you can mm. feel so many different things by this thing and you can feel like you're walking on air. Yeah. Um, but I just think that we need to slow the process down that it's not a new thing that mm -hmm. makes that happen. So it becomes from mm. us, the consumer, that we have to, we have to stop our addiction to those things we all know alcohol mm. and cigarettes and drugs are not good for us it's just that you're not putting mm. fast fashion in your body you're putting it on it mm -hmm. but very soon it's going to become apparent yeah that actually it's gonna it is going to make us all sick mm -hmm. you know we're not going to have clean air we're not going to have clean water you know and that yeah. goes on and so doing it now before it becomes like full-on emergency yeah. some people would say we are already in full-on emergency mm -hmm because it's not on our doorsteps because yeah. we're removed from it. Mm -hmm. But if you lived in Bangladesh, I think you'd be yeah. having a different conversation right now. Um, the model that I work on with my brand Kitty Joseph is that we are trying to do a slow fashion fast delivery, mm -hmm. which means that it's made bespoke, which means you can be inclusive because you can make to any size. Mm -hmm. So it's about having simple patterns mm -hmm. that can fit all bodies yeah. And then you cut them 
when people want to order them. And do they send their size into you or how yeah, does that so work? Yeah, so they just, you know, we, we obviously we can go from extra small to whatever, but if they say, I'm this measurement here, this measurement here, this measurement here, it's like semi-bespoke, yeah. but trying to get it out there to them, Quickly. you know, within, within mm. a sort of relatively quick time. Mm-hmm. It won't happen overnight because you'd still be sweat yeah. shopping, but, you know, within a week, and yeah. it's just like so people can kind of go, actually, a week, two weeks, three weeks, I'm going to wait for something yeah. for once. It's about being, it's not having that sort of mad candy floss crack kind of, I'm going to order mm. this now, I'm going to have it in a couple of hours and I'm going to wear it and I'm going to get the high and then I'm going to come down and probably never wear it yeah. again. Because it's only serving it's over, yeah. this kind mm. of addiction. And so um, by not having stock made, mm. we're not wasting it. Yeah. So we're not going, okay, let's make 60 size 14s and let's say we don't sell yeah. them all. And then slashing the price and reducing yeah. the value of yeah. the garment. So we also we don't really take we don't really do seasonal. Yeah. We don't take things off the site because people. We hope that we make clothes mm-hmm. that we're not on the model of being like saying that this is hot only right now, mm-hmm. and then by and then tearing it all down to make more money and going this is hot mm-hmm. right now, and then you know it's it's, mm-hmm. it's not this crash and burn cycle. It's people can come back in three months time they can come back in six months yeah. time it's still there yeah so that they can go actually i've saved up and actually i like that and i want it in a different color anyway because it suits me yeah it fits me yeah 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 absolutely <laughs> yeah. so we're trying to do a model and it's not that easy but i think that if people all if people started to the think, mindset again that's the real luxury mm. having mm-hmm. something made for you something that's bespoke yeah. you know we've only been doing ready to wear our yeah. bodies have mm. been numbers for 50, 60 yeah, years, yeah. you know, so it's just reverting to yeah. a thing where we used to have clothes made for us. Yeah. Having clothes made for us now is an utter luxury. Yeah. But if we can put that into a a part of a business structure that mm-hmm. doesn't have to be luxury prices, mm-hmm. it's just how the business is structured. Yeah. I think that, that everyone can move forwards in yeah. a way so you're not manufacturing. You're not manufacturing mm-hmm. in China, India, all of the footprints, the mm-hmm. flying in and out, like yeah. the people having stuff made in China and then components being flown to Italy and then finished there just so they can have made in Italy yeah. kind of label on them. And like one garment, you know, so I've, I've spoken to people in production and the different bits of a garment have been, have got more, they've flown yeah. around the world like once just to be made. Yeah. And you're just like, yeah, it's at it's what it. cost? Yeah. We have to keep thinking yeah. that. Yeah. Um, i trying to think, is there anything you want to say extra? Um, or do you think there's anything we've missed out? You know, I just think that going back to that in individuality piece, again, gives everybody back, gives models, designers, anybody, anybody who you are, that stance to go, I can make the decision that I want to mm. make. Um, and I think that that um, is the only way like, is to, to be self-resilient that kind of um, trying to find out who you are mm. in the in the noise, taking back your own power. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if and especially for women, if at the moment our purse is our power, then thinking about where you're spending it, and it's a really easy thing to do. It doesn't take long mm. when you're buying a takeaway coffee and a takeaway coffee cup, cup, or if you're buying from Zara and just being like, "Do I need this? Mm. Do I need this?" And what impact is this going to have globally? You know, what impact has it had? And then where is it going? Yeah. You know, and if and great if your budget is Zara, and you can do your thirty wears, but instead of you know instead of thinking, it's taking that moment at the till or when you're, because I understand it because, I, of addict an addictive personality, I was absolutely mad. I used to buy and buy and buy. So, I've had to stop. And just take that breath before you buy it. Before yeah. you, when you're crazed and you're going, this will make me feel better. Or you know, mm. it's just that moment to go, do I need this? Yeah. You know, because we all do it. You know, I'm still guilty of like falling into that, buying those dresses on Instagram that come from China, and you're just, and I'm just like, it's got me at a weak moment because we're not all mm. resilient, and it that mm. takes a lot in the face of the thousands and thousands of images we see a day. To try and be resilient yeah. is a full-time job. Well, it's every second, <laughs> basically. And so, yeah, we're yeah. going to fall down. But if you just take a breath 
And that's part of mindfulness yeah. to go, do I need this? And what place is it coming mm. from? What place is it coming from? Is it coming from I feel insecure? I feel sad. I feel angry. What is my need to buy mm-hmm. this thing? And if it's not like an actual need, then yeah. it's quite, it's actually easier. It's easier to step away and go, I'm going to, uh, if I give it a night, if you're still feeling that, you know, because it's like a, yeah. it's like a crazed urge yeah. that you're like, I need to have this. Blah, blah, blah. And all of the, all the rhetoric mm. around all of this stuff yeah. is get it now. It's gone in like, this has gone out of your basket yeah. in an hour, blah, blah, blah. It's based on yeah. that panic part mm. of yourself. And if you still love it overnight, go back. But if you can det- detach the addict part yeah. of your brain that is what everyone's mm-hmm. tapping into to go, just go step away. I don't yeah. actually need it. Then you're you're putting those boundaries up because it seems we're boundaryless yeah. now. We have no resilience, and that is for me is just that resilient that that thought of like where is this need or desire coming from? If we take a beat, mm. take a breath, and go. Actually, I don't really need yeah, this. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. What's next for you? So body of work. Oh, yeah. Still growing and kind of yeah. Yes, I said I want that. to. I want to really grow body of work. I'm writing a book about my crazy, insane journey burning through the fashion industry mm-hmm. about how it affected my mental health about how we look for identity female mm-hmm. identity you know about the how that manifested in myself mm-hmm. um and um hopefully growing some more small businesses mm-hmm. in better models to to sort of not as the not as the counter balance not as the antidote but just trying to because if I don't put my 20 year experience somewhere yeah I feel like just big big business wins and so by backing up a small Mm -hmm. designer as we all can yeah you know I'm putting my money where my mouth Mm -hmm. is by eschewing like big I I could be earning big money Mm -hmm. but I'm like no no I'm not going to do that what I'm going to do is get behind a small business and help that grow for the greater good of everybody else because it's you know I could but I had I had to make that decision for my yeah. mental health because I couldn't live with the way that I was mm-hmm. kind of being and I think that if anybody's got that doubt inside them they have to follow that path yeah. too so yeah I don't really know but you know I I hope my my thing now is I just want to help people mm-hmm. and by doing that I think we can create a better industry because Fashion particularly was not a kind industry. Mm. I think it's becoming better. But but being so exclusive, that it was always like any sort of behaviour was justified by bottom line. Yeah. It's an industry, darling. You know, just toughen up. You know, that whole thing, you know, if you're going to cry, go outside. It's like... And I just... That... Um, yeah. I just... I can't, I can't stand by that. Yeah. So, no. you know... And if that means I don't work in the fashion industry, then fine. But what I will do is try and help people be more resilient to mm. the messaging that I think is kind of almost impossible mm. to avoid. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I, I can't live on a planet where that's the messaging that I'm no. putting across. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> cool. We should talk Thanks. about your dress quickly. Oh. I love this. This is gorgeous. And I'm guessing this yeah. is vintage. Yeah. Charity yeah. shop. Um, oh my God. Where? Must have been a Hill. Really? Yeah. She's like, I don't want to tell anyone. Stretton Hill, don't you know. go there. No, it's actually changed that charity shop. It's not so good now. But it was bought for a friend's wedding, um, and actually, it was just too hot because she got married, and it was a really hot day. But, See, um, it's yeah. because this, the weirdly, and I love the evolution of Gucci, and at least they're kind of they're winning in the ethical stakes. Is that you can wear any old vintage yeah. and it and just pile it up and it looks like Gucci fashion forward. <laughs> I just love that. It's brilliant. It's like, wear what you like. And yeah. I love the fact that actually, if you can't afford to do the um, the high-end luxury mm. version of that, it's still like pieced together. Yeah. It's pushing back on how I used to dress as a teenager. And I, I love that. So It's curated though as well. And I think that's the important thing. You kind of, you know, you then become an identity and mm. you ch- choose and pick and collage. And I th- feel like we've lost that a little bit. Yeah, I think yeah, looks yeah. are just one gucci look or whatever created to look like something do you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah. cool yay thanks (laughs) okay 